Hey, nice to meet you. My name is Sabine Wieluch. I'm also known as BleepTrack and I work a lot with generative and AI art. And I'm very happy that I was invited today to give you a super quick dive into generative art and how you can code your own generative art with Paper.js. So yeah, let's get started. And what, what is generative art? So the main goal is to make some sort of art in the end. This can be anything you can think of. Images, videos, uh, music, poems, whatever you like. Though uh, in this workshop we will go with images and to make this uh, even more detailed we will create vector graphics, SVGs. And um, yeah, when we talk about generative art we always use some sort of rule set to make our art. This rule set in our case will be created by code by an algorithm that we write, but this doesn't uh, this doesn't need to be the case all the time. Some people also work with dices, and they just uh, yeah use dices in a physical in the physical world to generate random numbers and then put that in their rule set that they have in their mind and then draw certain shapes. That also works, but we will go with code, and that that's. Yeah, when you today hear generative art, you usually think of code and art. Um, yeah, as I already said, there are different kind of input types you can use. You can use, uh, yeah, random random numbers. Um, you can also make interactive generative art so that the user can or uh, generates the input, for example, with the Kinect, and you can scan the body pose and use that as input, that also works. You can also use completely different sensors that don't have to do anything with users. Let's say you have, I don't know, maybe a water sensor in your plant that could also work. Um, or maybe also any different kind of data, doesn't need to be sensors. You could also connect to a large databases like Wikidata and draw information from that and use that to generate your art. So the generative models that you write, they can have a lot of different parameters. This can either be like binary values, you can either use rectangles or circles, something like that. This can also be a range of numbers and usually you want to set a fixed minimum and maximum. So you find out, I don't know, maybe circles should at least be a certain size and should not get bigger than another size so that it still looks uh, good in some way. So this is something you have to figure figure out. Um, yeah, and when, when we're all already at figuring out stuff, um, there's one important thing that I want to tell you about generative art. Um, when you imagine uh, the space that you are in with a generative model, you have basically two spaces. There's uh, the possibility space, that is the space of all possible outcomes that you can do with your parameters and your settings. So every permutation uh, is a dot in that space. And you also have that generative space. This is usually uh, a, sub, uh, a subset um, of generative outcomes because you have some uh, cer certain constraints that you put on. Let's say when circles are small, you make them blue and when they get bigger, you make them red, something like that. Um, and for uh, generative art, there's a very important thing to consider. How large should your generative space be? Um, let's look at the two extremes. You can make it super big, so that it's basically the possibility space. So you get all permutations. Um, this has the positive side that you get a lot of different results, but they might get super boring or, it's, or like the results get yeah uninteresting or mushy because like you throw just random stuff there and hope that it looks good in some way and often it doesn't it gets sort of boring um, the other extreme would be that your generative space is very small and very defined um, has the positive side that you are very in control on what you generate and how it looks extremely in control maybe even so far that you only get one result and that makes it boring to use right because uh, the fun stuff on generative art is that you get different sorts of outcomes and you lose that when you make the generative space too small. So you need to somehow find a nice way in the middle where you have a nice variety but all the results still look interesting. 
Before we start with coding, I wanted to show you some of my work to give you a bit of inspiration what it's possible and maybe you can already find a bit of a, a certain path or certain thing that you're interesting to do later. Um, yeah, so uh, the first project I want to show you is called GenShare. And I found a paper that was really interesting about how you can simulate the vein growth in tree leaves. And that gives super interesting pattern. And that rule set, that algorithm is actually super easy to implement. And that's what I did. And um, yeah, to make it more like a leaf, you would uh, put it in a leaf shape. But in my case, I wanted to create a chair out of it. So I let these veins grow inside of a rectangle shape and then just threw that onto my CNC machine, which actually took quite long. So uh, the the backside and the seating plate took five hours each to cut out of my CNC machine. And yeah, when I put that together, I ended up getting a really interesting chair made out of uh, thick birch plywood and it looks quite fragile but actually it's really sturdy and I think that's a nice example that you can also use uh, sorts of, or simulation to create generative art. It doesn't need to be like a super hard-coded uh, rule set that you came up with. It can also be, you can also use uh, yeah, some sort of maybe uh, predefined simulation tools that usually works great. can also be like um, gravity simulation or something like that. What I also like to do a lot is working with pen plotters and this is also the reason why I started working with Paper.js because there are a lot of awesome tools for creating generative art and I think the most well-knowns are Processing and P5.js and they are extremely great tools and they have awesome communities with awesome learning materials. The one point that I was missing uh, when I started getting into generative art was a very good export for SVGs or vector graphics. Because as you can see, I work a lot with machines that need these paths to, yeah, to cut along or draw along, like CNC machines, pen plotters, laser cutters, and all that stuff. Also, 3D printing usually benefits if you have a nice uh, DXF file, for example, that you can work with. And that's why I started uh, using Paper.js, and that's also the tool I want to show you today. And this uh, project is, that you can see here is called Overflower. Yeah, it generates some sort of flowery images, maybe it looks a bit like succulents, succulent plants. And what you can see here is what I talked about earlier about the importance of choosing the right size of your generative space. You can see that these flowers, they look quite different. Um, some have pointy uh, leaves, some have more round leaves, there are different filling patterns, they are placed in different locations in their, in their square, so they look quite different, but they also, you can see that they belong to the same model, and that's a nice feeling that I usually want to create with my artworks, that you have a nice, that you can generate a nice row of different images, they look like they belong together, but each one is interesting on its own. That's super important to me. My latest project is called Pico Planet. And yeah, I like a lot to experiment with different materials and how I can transfer these digital artworks into the physical world. And with this project, I tried to yeah, put generative art on PCBs. And it was a very interesting task for me because for each new material that you experiment with, you need to find out prerequisites on how you need to prepare your digital file so that it's easy to process it in the basically in the processing path that you choose. In this case, I'm not sure if you maybe have looked at a PCB, you have different layers. Um, you have these copper layers, then there's a solder mask on top, and on the solder mask there can be a screen print, in this case that's the, that's the white screen print. And I want to somehow utilize these different layers because uh, different combinations uh, give different colors. For example, with Pico Planet you can see these swirls in the background and they, uh, the lighter swirls are a combination uh, with copper and solder mask and the dark background uh, are places where there's no copper under the solder mask. So you can play with that or for example um, the, these uh, little sort of yellow stars, they don't have 
uh, layers on top of them at all. So it's only the base plate and you can use them to shine light through the PCB. So always think about what your end product will be. You have similar um, interesting cases when you use pen plotters because when you create digital paintings and for example you have a circle with another circle on top and they have a fill color you can just draw them on top on the, and one will partly overlap, uh, overlap the other that's totally fine if you put the same SVG later on a pen plotter you will have a problem with that overlap because both circles still exist so both circles will be drawn completely and you need to find a way to like cut out certain shape paths so that they are not drawn later in the image so this is all stuff that you need to think out in the best case before you start to write your code uh, or maybe you need to refactor that later. What I can also highly recommend is using generative art in the creation of uh, event corporate designs because uh, you can also not only publish a, docu a design document with all the colors and stuff that people should do for their slides, but you can also create a generator as a tool and give all participants this tool to easily create their own logo uh, version or their own uh, presentation slide backgrounds and that automatically automatically fits the corporate design of your event and this is a very interesting thing to see when people start using these and they like to use it because it's either fun to use for example or it's just a convenient way for them to get their own images but um, when they start using it and a lot of people use it the, Im the whole event gets more yeah you know like corporate designs like uh, it gets more a more community feeling and if you make it easy for people to get this community feeling by uh, conveniently making their own images this is usually a huge step and people will start I don't know printing their own t-shirts or their own merch stuff with their own variation of the logo and this is usually a super fun thing to see and for the last years I did this for Chaos Communication Congress um, and made generators for people to use and it's yeah it's always great to see how people use the use these uh, images in their own creative ways one super quick last idea that i want to give you what you can do with your uh, generative piece and also maybe with a generator that we will write at the end of the day um, is to make it into a Twitter bot or a social media bot. Doesn't need to be Twitter, of course. Um, but it's this very interesting thing to experience because you give your art a very con a very casual way to be viewed. Like people can just subscribe. It's, let's stay with the Twitter example. Can just subscribe to the Twitter feed of your creative art bot. And yeah, every now and then, every few hours, a new image will be created and they can just watch it and can comment on it. And this is a super, I don't know, like, yeah, open and public way to show your art. And also it's a very nice way for you as the creator to consume your art, because I guess you will also follow your uh, art bot and yeah. Um, when you throw, uh, scroll through your timeline, you will see a new image and it's, it wasn't you who, who had to push the generate button. So it gives always a nice warm feeling to your heart when you can interact with your own art in a very easy way and you don't have to interfere a lot. So that's all for the beginning. I hope, th hope this gave you a bit of inspiration and we will start coding now. Um, to do so, please go to paperjs.org. Um, this is uh, the JavaScript library that we will be using. And there are three links that might be of interest to you. One is the references link where you can find all the documentation. There's also a link called tutorials, which gives, gives nice written short tutorials on different topics. And the imp most important one is the sketch link because paperjs has a great online editor and this is where we will start now. So in this quick generative coding example, we want to create a grid made out of rectangles and these rectangles should change along the axis. So X and Y axis and also some stuff diagonally. I prepared certain steps in the coding process for you so that you don't have to watch me writing down all the code and 
uh, I can better explain you what we do and how it works. So in the first step we end up with a red rectangle. Uh, Paper.js has a class that is called path and that basically holds every kind of vector graphic path that you would usually use, but it has also some nice predefined forms of paths, for example rectangles. And these rectangles, they need some certain information so they know how to look. Um, rectangles need the position, in this case that's the top left point, and also the size, so how big the rectangle should end up being. In this case we placed it in position 8080 and the size that's a bit hard to read. The size is 50 by 50 units. Uh, with vector graphics you usually don't work with pixels, it's more units and sometimes also depends on the exports what the units end up being with. Sometimes it might be millimeters or different stuff. Um, this rectangle also needs some styling information so that it's visible. Um, in vector graphics you have usually two main options to style. You have the fill color and you have the stroke color and yeah also the stroke width. Um, and these are just set here with the attribute stroke color width and fill color. And with paper.js it's really nice that you for colors can use basically any type of color descriptions you know from CSS. So you can use the CSS color names, you can go RGB or HSL, basically anything you want. And to make this a quick example, I just uh, use the color strings black and red and I set the stroke width to two. So when I run the code, you can already see the result, we get a little rectangle. So let's take this one step further. We want to make a grid out of the rectangles. So I, uh, you can basically choose any grid size you want to make this a bit easier to look at in the recording. I choose a smaller grid with six by six rectangles. I put this in a uh, separate variable so that we can reuse this later better. And yeah, basically we just take two for loops and make a grid. I didn't change much. Um, interesting parts is just a placing maybe so we can use the x and y coordinates to place it in a nice grid. When they have the size uh, of 50 by 50, we maybe want to have a bit of space between the rectangles. So I ch um, choose a position that is a bit larger. When we want to decrease the space between the rectangles, we can also just decrease these numbers and then it gets smaller. Choose it as you like. Um, I think the 80 by 80 looks quite nice because later we want to manipulate these rectangles and it's nice to have a bit of space between them. And then there's also one really nice function. Color uh, Paper.js has a color class and this class has a random function so it just gives you a random color. That's super nice and super easy to use. But if you now look at that rectangle grid, it looks a bit messy, right? Like you throw a lot of colors in there in one place and it, yeah looks a bit messy. It might be nice to change the colors later on, but first uh, let's start to manipulate the shapes and forms of these rectangles. In the next step um, I start to scale them along the x-axis. Um, that's also super easy to do. Um, you can scale a path just with the scale method and um, usually you might uh, start with um, because we want to make them bigger, we can just go with x, uh, our x-axis coordinate divided by the number of rectangles we have there. But if we do that, uh, we will lose the first row because we start with zero because x starts counting with zero, in this case at least. This is why I added one to that x here, so that we start with a small rectangle and it doesn't get invisible. And then we grow to the original size. The next step we can then do is rotate the rectangles. Um, that's also super easy to do. There's a rotate function that takes degrees. And in this example, um, we can maybe just go through that step by step. So if you just want to rotate it more along the y axis, we can, for example, just throw in a y in there. But uh, why we just count from 0 to uh, 6, then it's, we end up with 6 degrees, that's not that much. 
but we can uh, just add some uh, yeah some factor in there uh, for example let's say we take it times three that's also it yeah it rotates a bit but it could be more and we could also maybe make it more fancy and just throw in our grid size in there for example it rotates it even more so we end up with a six in the end and to make it even more interesting um, we can throw in a random factor for example um, And that's more or less what I did here in the beginning. We have our factor, we have a, also a random factor, and also uh, we always add a certain number, because if we would not do this, we might up end with a zero overall, because math random uh, can give you a zero, um, and that would make the whole term a zero. So we always want to have at least three degrees and then maybe more. And that looks quite fun if we press play a couple of times here. That looks good. I think we can go to the next step and play even more with that sketch. Um, let's get some colors in there. Uh, this is what we want to end up with. We want a color gradient from the top left spot in our grid to the bottom right. Um, and we choose two random colors to do so and we need to calculate the steps from one color to another. So let's figure out how to calculate that. Um, first, we take two random colors, like here. That's uh, what you have already seen, that's nothing new. Um, the nice thing with Paper.js is that you can, uh, that Paper.js uses a nice way of operator overloading. So you can just use plus, minus, divide and stuff um, to uh, add or sub subtract vectors and colors in paper.js are also basically just vectors in their color space. So what do we do when we want to calculate a gradient is um, we want to calculate the vectors in the color space. So first we have uh, we have color one, color two, and we need to know a little ve the little vector steps that we can iteratively add on to make that gradient. So this is what the color dist function does. So we take the large vector from one to two and then divide it by the number of steps we need. So how did I come up with that number? Um, super easy. We have that, we have our grid. Let's see how many colors we need. So um, because all uh, all rectangles that are diagonally on the same line, they get the same color. So this is one color, these rectangles get one color, these two, these two. So we have one, two, six until we are in the middle and then we need uh, five more until we reach the end. So it's always the uh, grid size plus grid size minus one and that's why we end up with this number. So what we now have is that small vector and uh, I want to save them in an array so that I can later just grab the calculated color. Um, so uh, to get each, yeah, each vec color vector, we can always go with color one and then add the small distance vector on top iteratively. And then we just need, like here, set the fill color in the right place instead of the random color that we took before. That's basically it, and it gives you a nice gradient, and I think that really looks looks really interesting, makes it way more pleasant to look at. And often picking colors in generative art can be quite hard because two random colors often don't match very well, but if you make them into a gradient, they suddenly start to work quite well. At least in most cases, there are still problems if they are too similar, maybe. Um, that's maybe an idea if you want to work further on that code to make sure that colors are not too similar or maybe choose colors that are on the opposite side of the color spect spectrum maybe. That's everything you can do later. Okay, next step. We want to add a bit more interesting stuff uh, to the image. That's basically more or less the last step that we will do. Um, we add more rectangles that are not filled, but are a bit uh, not distorted, but rotated differently and also scaled differently. So that makes it more interesting uh, to look at. And there's not a lot we have to do to make this. Um, we just add another nested loop. This is this loop that counts 
uh, i until it reaches two like uh, three times so we add three rectangles the first rectangle this is this one here that gets the fill color like in the step before um, the others don't get a fill color so they stay transparent and then we need to play a bit with the rotation and especially the scaling. Uh, to be honest, we don't need to change a lot of, or actually nothing with the rotation because it also already has that random factor. So they will always look a bit different. Um, nothing, nothing much to change here. But the scale factor, um, we can add the eye in here, which is really nice. So the scaling um, from each stacked rectangle is already one step ahead, basically. This is why they look a bit bigger, like. Um, this rectangle, this colored rectangle now becomes also the same rectangle size from the next step and the step after that. Um, so they get bigger. And that's basically it. If we, when we let that run a bit, that makes it really interesting. And then there's one last teeny tiny thing that we can do. Currently you can see that the whole sketch is basically glued to the top left corner because of the way we calculate the positions. Um, and it's uh, easy to do it in that way, but maybe we want to center it to make it look a bit more appealing if you would integrate that to a website or something. And that's an uh, easy thing to do that. We put everything in one group. This is uh, also a paper.js class and every, every path object that we create, we need to add that to that group. That's done by add child. And in our case, we just throw in the rectangle and now comes the the fancy part, we can just set the group position to the view center. The view is also an object that is given by paper.js and that's like a super helpful line to just center stuff. Can highly recommend using that. And that's how we end up with our nice rectangle generative art piece. Please feel free to experiment more with this code example. I prepared a link for you, which is called example.bleeptrack.de. Uh, that link will bring you directly to this uh, paper.js sketch. By the way, it's super nice to share them because the URL enco encodes the whole code. So uh, the links get quite long, but you can share your whole project with that. So yeah, just, just go there. Uh, you will find the example we created together today. And yeah, feel free to experiment further with it. Go crazy. Um, experiment with colors or certain ways to choose two colors for the gradient. Maybe you can also play with opacity or blending modes. There's a thing we didn't talk about at all, which makes really nice effects. Maybe you know these blending modes from Photoshop where you can like uh, have a multiply layer so you can uh, mix different uh, half transparent layers together to get new colors. That's super fancy. Maybe make it interactive or animate the rectangles make them pulsating or create shapes by scaling in an animation or make it interactive by i don't know maybe people can choose their color or can drag some rectangles around or change the rotation or something so yeah uh yeah go crazy experiment a lot that's the fun thing with gen generative art just try a bunch of things that come to your mind and see how it goes and where it takes you have fun coding and I hope to see you soon. If you have any questions or want to reach uh, to me, you can find uh, my contacts on my website, bleeptrack.de, or you can f also find me, for example, on Twitter or Instagram or other social media channels in, uh, by the name of Bleeptrack. Yeah, have fun at GitHub Universe and see you soon. Bye.